And now um, on Tuesday, 21st September of 2021, I'm Ochik from ITS Global Engagement and will be your master of ceremony of this afternoon. Um, thank you for joining our guest lecture series on SDGs today. Before we start our agenda, let me inform you some rules for this event. First, please adjust your name or ID screen using format name underscore campus, for example, Ochi underscore ITS. Second, during the lecture, please turn off your microphone and only turn on the microphone when the moderator gives the chance. And third, please fill your attendance on bit.ly GLS underscore attendance. Our committee also send the attendance link on the Zoom chat room. For the participant who wish to get an e-certificate and STEM, please fill the attendance 15 minutes after the session starts. Fourth, participants who wish to ask questions during the question and answer or q &A session, please send your question to b.ly slash gls underscore q and a2 and the link also listed in the chat room as well. Or uh, later, you can ask directly by clicking raise hand feature if the moderator gives you the chance to. Okay, so today's deals on ICDGs will present a topic entitled 5G millimeter wave base station exposure, are we safe? That will be delivered by a SOC professional technologist, Dr. Hasliza Arahim from University Malaysia Perlis with the asynchronous. Other than that, we will also have a topic entitled important accessibility from PVDs in the city. And that will be delivered by a soft professor Izawati Tukiman from International Islamic University, Malaysia. And this lecture will be moderated by Ibu Nur Endah Nufida from ITS. And before we start uh, our agenda, allow me to deliver all of our schedule today as follow. First, we will have opening as we do it now. Second, we will have introduction to the moderator and speaker. Third, we will have our lecture session and then we will follow by Q&A session. After that, we will have certificate awarding and finally closing. Okay, so now we're gonna proceed to our next agenda. Please let me introduce our moderator. Our moderator of today is Ibu Nur Endah Nufida, lecturer at Department of Architecture, Institute Technology, 10 November. Ibu Nur Endah Nufida received her bachelor degree from Department of Architecture at Brawijaya University and Magister of Engineering from Architectural Design and Criticism at ITS with her research interests, art media aesthetics, will being historic environment and many more. Okay, now without further ado, let's proceed to the main agenda, Ibu Endah Nufida. The time is yours, Ibu. Thank you, Maochi. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nur Enda Nufida, the moderator of this guest lecture series on sustainable development goals. In this event, we will discuss two topics. First, 5G millimeter wave based stations exposure, are we safe? And second, important accessibilities for persons with disabilities in the city. Before the presentation begin, let me inform how the presentation will proceed. Each speaker will be invited to present the lecture for approximately 40 minutes, followed by a session of questions and answer for 30 minutes. The first topic will be presented by our first speaker, Associate Professor, Professional Technologist, Hasliza Arahim, and the later topic will be a lecture by our second speaker, Associate Professor Izawati Tukiman. Our first speaker today is Associate Professor, Professional Technologist Hasliza Arahim. She is a lecturer from University of Malaysia, Police. She has received her bachelor degree in electrical engineering, majoring in modern communication system 
at University of Southern California, USA, and her master's degree in electronic system design engineering at University Science Malaysia in project management. In 2013, she completed her PhD degree in communication engineering at University of Malaysia Police. From 2020 until present, she is appointed as head of Bioelectromagnetic Group Advanced Communication Engineering Center of Excellence. Before, she was appointed as a program chairperson postgraduate studies at School of Computer and Communication Engineering at University of Malaysia Police. Her expertise room on subject as follows, wearable and conformal antennas, metamaterials, antenna interaction with human body, on-body communication, green microwave absorbers, wireless body area networks, bioelectromagnetics, and last but not least, physical layers protocols for WBAM. And our second speaker, Associate Professor Izawa Titukiman, is a lecturer from International Islamic University, Malaysia. He, she received his, uh, her bachelor degree in architecture at University Technology Malaysia or UTM at 1996 and Bachelor of Science in Housing, Building and Planning at University Science Malaysia. She took her master in landscape architecture at University Science Malaysia in 2000. She received her doctoral degree in sustainable urban landscape at University of Sheffield United Kingdom at 2009. Her professional work experience from 2020 until today, she is an associate professor at Kulia of Architecture and Environmental Design at International Islamic University of Malaysia. She was also appointed as deputy director, Center for Professional Development. And before, she was an assistant professor at Kulia for Architecture and Environmental Design, also in International Islamic University of Malaysia. She wrote several books, but we could see here there were three prominent books she wrote with title User Perception of Flood Mobile Homes as Shelter Relief Center uh, and Stewardship, the Quest for a Sustainable Landscape and graphic book of rendering and coloring and many more. So without further ado, allow me to welcome Associate Professor Professional Technology Hasliza Arahim to deliver her presentation. Uh, I believe the organizer will um, have the chance to give the opportunity to deliver for all of us. Over to you, the organizer, thank you. Assalamualaikum dan salam sejahtera. sejahtera. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, Kabare. Greetings from Malaysia. Uh, so thank you very much Institute Technology 10 November ITS Surabaya Indonesia for inviting me to, to deliver a talk in guest lecture series on sustainable development goals. Um, so the, the title for my talk today is 5G millimeter wave base station exposure. Are we safe? I'm Associate Professor Technologist Dr. Haziza Ibrahim from Advanced Communication Engineering, Center of Excellence, Faculty of Electronic Engineering Technology, University of Malaysia Perlis. So before we go deep into uh, my talk today, I would like to introduce myself with short bio. I have published five book chapters with 161 papers in peer-reviewed journals and conferences uh, indexed by Scopus. Uh, with H index 14 uh, for Scopus, 16 for uh, Google Scholar, I have 16 postgraduate students. Uh, with total research funding more than 1.9 million uh, ringgit Malaysia, two patent grants, two patent filings, and two copyrights. I'm the recipient of Global Award 
recipient of two Best Paper Awards conference, international conference, and ISI journals, uh, Q2, which is I2PSS, Young Scientist Unimap for four consecutive years, a recipient of several awards such as Unimap Journal Impact Research Excellent Awards, and I'm also visiting professor at Universitas Ubudia, Indonesia. As we all know that the Sustainable Development Goals has been initiated by the United Nations that consists of 17 goals. So today I will deliver my talk that give impacts to SDG3, uh, good health and well-being, uh, to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. So my topic for today is related to SDG3. So what is EMF? Uh, EMF stands for electromagnetic field, consists of waves. Uh, these waves have two main components, which are electric and magnetic energy that moves together through space. Uh, EMF occurs naturally with the Earth, the Sun, and the ionosphere. Uh, are all natural resources of EMF in our everyday life. So means that we are living uh, surrounded by the EMF. Uh, for the EMF category, uh, the EMF uh, spectrum ranges from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. So EMF is classified as non-ionizing electromagnetics uh, that are applied by uh, applied for radio transmission television uh, mobile or cellular and satellite meanwhile the upper spectrums consists of uh, um, several types uh, of ray such as infrared uh, visible light uh, uv x-rays and gamma rays. Okay, so uh, the dangerous radiations are classified as ionizing radiation that can cause uh, broken chemical bonds. So this is uh, very dangerous to us. Meanwhile, for the EMF, uh, it is not um, dangerous as the ionizing radiation. Why? Because the only known effect uh, caused by the EMF is heating. Okay, so I will uh, explain further what we mean by heating effects caused by the EMF. Okay, so the highest power transmission are emitted by the TV and radio broadcasts range from 20k to 100k watts. Uh, meanwhile, for the base station, the power transmissions are between 2 to 50 watts and the lowest one is Wi-Fi uh, with power transmission of 0 0.1 watts. Okay, so based on the previous, uh, on the published work, uh, they find out that the amount of RF energy measured at ground level near base station uh, is thousands of times less than the limits for safe exposure set by the regulatory authorities. Uh, uh, this means that uh, EMF exposure by the base station is uh, very, very safe. Okay, so I will... In I will explain later about uh, what is the most widely used regulatory authorities uh, that uh, are being uh, applied by most of the countries. Okay, let's me let me introduce uh, uh, what is five uh, G and its evolution. 
As shared in this figure, mobile communication technology has been evolving into a new generation every 10 years, while mobile communication services have undergone a major change every 20 years. Uh, so uh, this happened starting from 1G up to 4G, and now we are in the face of 5G and beyond. If this trend continues, a third wave 5G is anticipated to generate, will be bigger than the previous one fueled by the technologies of an upgraded version of 5G, 5G evolution, and the following six generation 6G and to support industry and society in the 2030s. So 5G is characterized by high data rate or high capacity, low latency, and massive connectivity. With these features, 5G is expected to further upgrade multimedia communication services from the level achieved by the previous generation, including 4G. And yes, we are moving towards more and more advanced technology. And uh, 5G is to provide new value as a fundamental technology that supports uh, future industry and society along with artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. So these are some of the key technology terms that uh, we have for the 5G, uh, MM wave, high frequency between 17 to 100 gigahertz and high bandwidth, reasonably short range technology used in dense populated area. So um, the deployment of a 5G millimeter wave uh, will be targeted in the dense populated area. Uh, sub 6 gigahertz, Wi-Fi light frequency between 3 to 6 gigahertz, a small cell hub for indoor use or outdoor base station for medium range like existing 4G LTE, low band below 800 megahertz for very long distance provide blanket backbone coverage, informing use in sub 6 gigahertz or MM wave base station to direct reform towards consumer devices can cover range and direction limitation of high frequency waveforms. Okay, so a massive multiple input, multiple output is defined as systems that use antenna arrays with a few hundred antennas simultaneously serving many tens of terminals in the same time frequency resources. A massive uh, refers to high number of antennas. Uh, when I Google in, <clears throat> when I Google uh, the, the the planning of the 5G networks uh, deployment, uh, this is what I get. Uh, Indonesia now is moving towards 5G and um, they, they are planning to roll out the 5G networks uh, by end of this year or early next year, uh, similar with Malaysia. So. Uh, it looks like uh, Indonesia is also moving uh, towards 5G uh, together with uh, Malaysia and also other countries in Southeast uh, region. Okay. We hope that with this fast connectivity, uh, it will bloom the economic growth and uh, other benefits. Uh, uh, will be obtained by the by our societies. Okay, so what are the major public concern uh, related to the base station exposure uh, from two G up until five G? So here I listed out five uh, public concern uh, related to the human health. Okay, that uh, I extract from the literature review, from the published work. The first one is sleep and cognitive disturbance. Second is base station and brain cancer. Third is cancer risk. Fourth is reproductive health. And the uh, final one is uh, neurodegeneration. So what does it mean by neurodegeneration? Neurodegeneration is loss of function of neurons.
On 27 August 2020, UK Engineering and Technology Magazine reported that the UK government has published a guide for the, bub the public about 5G networks due to the increase of 5G conspiracies on social media platforms, including theories that COVID-19 pandemic uh, could be linked to the new networks in some way. The mis information spread quickly and led to numerous accounts of people vandalizing 5g masks over their concern so um, uh, because people are thinking that 5g networks um, cause the spreading of the covid 19 uh, they have done uh, several uh, destruction to the 5G base station towers, uh, especially in the UK. So it means that this is not the regional uh, issue, but this is um, alarming global issue that has to be uh, taken care of. And... Uh, that is why <coughs> I chose this topic in order to educate the public, uh, the society uh, that 5G, of course, is not linked to COVID-19 and it is safe uh, for um, the public health. So these are the myths. Uh, and facts about RF, EMF. <coughs> okay, so what people think about RF, EMF is uh, people think that RF, EMF is ionizing radiation, okay, uh, which is as dangerous as the nuclear and also UV light and gamma ray, uh, sorry, and the X rays. Okay, so we have to understand about ionizing radiation scenario. Uh, when the energy signal hit the atom here, okay, so the energy signal hit the atom, uh, the electrons will be removed from the atoms. Uh, okay, so this scenario happens uh, for the X-ray and also gamma rays. So this is what we call as a, a mutation process because it changed the structure of the biological tissues, okay. The reality is, the fact is, RF EMF is a non-ionizing radiation that cannot disrupt the structure of biological tissues. Why? Because it does not have enough energy to break the chemical bonds within molecules. Thus, it cannot cause ionization in human body however it causes some heating effects but usually not enough to cause any kind of long-term damage to tissues so this is what we have to understand about the behavior or the characteristic of the rf emf which is totally different than the uh, gamma rays or x rays uh, that are classified under ionizing radiation. So how RF interact with human body and uh, cause the heating effect? So here I take the example of the frequency from 100 megahertz up to uh, 10 gigahertz. Uh, because uh, because we are going to observe uh, the relationship when the frequency is getting higher and higher. Okay, so RF uh, in this range are able to penetrate exposed tissue and through fast oscillatory movement of ions and H2O molecules to give energy which is converted to heat. So this is what's happening, okay? 
So let's see uh, for case A up to 300 megahertz, EMF interacts with whole body and is able to penetrate. In some specific points, EMS, EMF can deeply penetrate. Okay, for case B from 300 megahertz to some gigahertz, there is only a local and not uniform absorption. So as we can see here, uh, the red color, um, the red color shows uh, the, absor the absorption of the EMF uh, by our body, by our uh, body tissues. Okay, so for the case C, uh, when the frequency up to 10 gigahertz energy absorption happens only on the body surface. Okay, so what we can conclude here, the higher frequency of RF, the lower EMF energy absorption happens. Okay, uh, so this shows us that uh, for 5G millimeter wave exposure, minimum energy absorption will occur to human body, which is uh, less uh, heating effects to the human body. Okay, so what is uh, heating effects? Heating of skin is one representative impact on the human body caused by EMF exposure. And the temperature for our skin outer surface normally ranges from 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. And we can feel the pain when uh, our body is exposed to higher temperature, 43 degrees Celsius and beyond. And this, of course, can cause a long-term injury. Okay? Uh, heating is considered as a significant impact since it can cause subsequent effects such as cell damage and protein induction. Okay, so from uh, the literature review, peer-reviewed publications, it shows that the heating effects caused by the RF EMF exposure is not uh, up to uh, 43 degrees Celsius. Okay, so it shows that yes, there is an effect uh, by this RF EMF exposure, but uh, it is not uh, up to uh, the extension that can cause uh cell damage okay so uh only a little only a bit of the temperature rises are detected uh, when uh, the humans are exposed to rf emf so this is the case where uh, some study are doing the investigation of the rf uh, emf effect uh, from the mobile phone uh, exposure okay so how about uh, sorry however uh, for the case of the base station rf emf uh, the heating effects are not being reported okay so what is the guideline for human exposure in terms of human exposure guidelines the world health organization notes that a number of national and international organization have formulated guidelines establishing limits for occupational and residential emf exposure the exposure limits for emf fields developed by the international commission on non-ionizing radiation protection ICNIP, a non governmental organization formally organized by the WHO were developed following reviews of all the peer-reviewed scientific literature including uh, terminal sorry uh, thermal and non-thermal effects the standards are based on evaluations of biological effects that have been established to have health consequences uh, in 2011, the International Agency for 
uh, research on cancer IARC has classified EMF as possibly carcinogenic to human group 2B based on positive association uh, between glioma and acoustic neuroma and exposure to RF EMF from wireless telephones. In terms of what the IARC 2B classification means, the WHO summarized this as possibly carcinogenic to humans is a classification used to denote an agent for which there is limited evidence of carcinogenicity in humans and less sufficient evidence in experimental animals. In 2014, IARC published the World Cancer Report and say that the most significant causes of all head and neck cancers are tobacco use and alcohol consumption. This exposure account for the development of approximately 80% of such cancer uh, globally. Brain tumors account for less than 2% of the overall human cancer burdens. Okay. Okay, from this report, uh, uh, what the IARC uh, found out that the major cause of head and neck cancers are by the tobacco use, uh, most probably from the cigarette, lah, cigarette uh, consumption and alcohol consumption. This is not uh, related to the RF EMF uh, base station exposure or uh, the mobile phone exposure. Okay, so for the RF EMF standards, um, most of the countries in the world have uh, used the ICNIC guidelines uh, in order to ensure that uh, the power transmission of the base stations are below the safety guidelines. Okay. So in Malaysia, we have um, our own regulatory body that governs uh, these safety guidelines. It is under Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commission. And these are the mandatory standards. Uh, that we adopt from the ICNIM. Okay, so what is the RF emission exposure limit? Uh, so this limit is defined by ICNIM. Uh, okay, as you can see in the table. Okay, for 2G 1800 megahertz, the power density is 9 and if your value is 58.34 uh, volt per meter, okay? And for the 4G and also 5G millimeter wave, the power density is uh, maximum is 10 watt per meter square. And the EFU value is 61 uh, for both frequency 4G and also 5G millimeter wave. Uh, the average RF emission level recorded from telecommunication transmitters in Malaysia is 0 0.00093 watt per meter square which is less than one percent of the ICNIC permissible exposure limit uh, this shows that what what we find out uh, what the M mcmc find out uh, from the rf uh, emf measurement from the base station tower within the regions of far field um the the e field strength or the uh, power density is one is very very low uh, compared to the ICNIC permissible exposure uh, for the 2g 3g and also for the uh, 4g okay so for for the 5g the uh, we are not yet doing the testing because uh, Malaysia has not rolled out the 5G uh, uh, 5G so we are waiting for the 5G rollout then uh, I, I am very sure that MCMC will do measurement 
uh, to check uh, the safety uh, level for the 5G exposure. Okay, so scenarios on how we perform the measurement of uh, the e field strength and also the power density. Uh, this is the base station uh, antenna exposure. And in order for us to ensure that uh, the exposure of the base station antenna, uh, the far field uh, region is uh, taken into account. And we are using the R RNS uh, spectrum analyzer and also the probe to measure the e field strength. So, what is the e field strength? So, e field strength is the uh, the the strength of uh, the electric. The strength of the electric exposed by the base station uh, antenna, okay? And uh, this strength is measured in terms of volt per meter, okay? Volt per meter. Most previous researchers have focused solely on the uplink with little attention paid to EMF emission generated by the base stations in a 5G networks. Uh, this figure illustrates the geometric difference between two directions of communications, which are uplink and downlink in 5G. The uplink in 5G is described as the allocation of power uh, resources among users, okay, here, uh, as, as I show you here, uh, via user equipment uh, such as mobile phones. The power resource uh, centralization inside the base station is the downlink. So this is the, the downlink part. Uh, centralized uh, inside the base station. Okay, so we can see here uh, the EIRP uh, is given uh, by 71 dpm. Okay, so what is EIRP? So EIRP is defined as an effective isotropic radiated power. Uh, that is measured. Uh, is measured. Okay. Uh, radiated power of an antenna in a specific direction. Okay. Um, 55 dBm is about uh, 300 watts. Uh, meanwhile, 71 dBm is about 12,000 watts. The changes adopted by 5G millimeter wave can be summarized as follows. Uh, increased carrier frequency operation. Yes, we know that for the 5G millimeter wave, it can go up to 28 gigahertz. Reduction in cell size resulting in an increase in number of base stations uh, because we know that the, the millimeter wave have a very short wavelength and it cannot travel far. Uh, so the cell size of uh, the, the base station uh, will be reduced. Uh, and this is what we call as a pico cells. Okay. Greater EMF concentration in an antenna beam. Okay, so uh, these are our research activities uh, in collaboration with the MCMC, uh, where we have uh, MCMC visits to Unimap Bio EM uh, 5G facilities laboratory. So Unimet has taken um, initiative uh, to conduct a 5G, uh, 5G base station uh, exposure in millimeter wave uh, in order to uh, confirm whether there is, uh, there is uh, health effect or not. 
uh, on the human body. Okay. Okay, so in conclusion, the 5G technology itself is very similar to 4G uh, in terms of its pulse signals, uh, the same as GSM and a version of 4G. So uh, this apply for the uh, sub, -six, sub 6 gigahertz uh, and uh, low band 5G as there has been no dispensation for 5G safety standards, it will have to meet the same standard, same safety standards as 2G, 3G and 4G, meaning 5G is just as safe as 2G, 3G and 4G, okay? Uh, for the sub-6 gigahertz and low band 5G, okay? However, um, for the 5G millimeter wave, okay, the strength of 5G signals are set to be well below the recommended uh, limit uh, to ensure its safety to the public uh, health. Okay? Uh, and the fact that we have to know about 5G millimeter wave prestation, it will have lower transmission power, uh, means that uh, it will be... Uh, low to the ground and safe for the public. Uh, okay, for the future work, more research uh, should be done for the millimeter wave uh, exposure as uh, now there are uh, limited uh, studies has been done for the 5G uh, millimeter wave. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you do have any question, you can uh, ask me later on in the next session. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ibu Professor Hasliza Arahim. And now let us move on to um, second presenter. Let us welcome Associate Professor Izawati Pukiman to deliver her presentation. Uh, sorry to interrupt, Prof. Iza. Yes. Uh, we cannot hear your voice. We still cannot hear you. Yes, Ibu Iza, we, we uh, could not hear your voice until now. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. No, it's good and clear. Elisa, okay. Please. That will be better. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, before we start, let me introduce myself. I am Izawati Pekiman. Uh, I am a mother of six. And when you, you have so many members in your family, uh, it is difficult for me to get a nice pic of er a picture of everybody. So this is my family. Um, I have been teaching at the International Islamic University of Malaysia for almost 20 years and I am actively involved in universal design activities, especially on access auditing as researcher, facilitator and consultant. 
then you'll definitely benefit from my topic today on the importance of accessibility in the city. If you have any questions or clarifications about my talk, you may ask me right after my presentation. If by any chance you miss on some important points, don't worry, you may contact me via my email, which I will share at the end of this presentation. Okay. Why city needs to be inclusive and accessible? According to the World Health Organization, there are 15% of the world population lives with an impairment or dis disability. Urban areas are clustered, dense settlements with population above a certain size. As the world population increase, more people will live in cities. This means more people with disability will be living as city dwellers. With this result of current um, global trend in population aging and a global increase in chronic health conditions, the incidence of impairment and disability among the general population is expected to increase. We are aware that people with disability are from various social backgrounds, such as young, elderly, women, men, and every race and ethnicity. Most cities have developed with less consideration on its physical and social barriers affect on which give an uh, impact to the people with disability. If cities are built with accessibility in mind, people with disability will free included socially, and at the same time, they can be independent. Well, um, so how to make city accessible? Urban areas are places characterized by urban ways of living, urban ways of relating to other people, urban economic activities, urban forms of identity and social organizations. Large, dense, populated urban areas include independent administrative uh, district, economy district, uh, residential, education, and many more. So urbanization is an indigenous uh, source of sustainable development and a tool for social integration and equity. City is a place where lots of activities happen and for sure it is a place where lots of people gather to socialize. Having more people with disability to do need planners to think about the different types of exclusions and barriers that people face in their everyday lives. We can see it not only emphasized on PWDs, but we also take into our consideration on elderly, children's, pregnant mothers, which we also have them in our society. So accessibility is the key to inclusive city. We can observe that um, access to urban sector will take us to build environment, public spaces, transportation and information and communication and also public services. Urban areas are densely settled places which have built up settlement and the elements that assist in its community in their, their daily life. People with disability may face difficulties to access to housing, transport, education, um, employment, health services and information technology if it was not accessible by them. As we are aware, people live, migrate, coming to the cities for lots of activities. The cities is place where people work, business, tourism activities, education, sightseeing, healthcare, social interaction, transportation hubs, and many more. People activities become disabled when society fails to accommodate them in social and infrastructural development either purposely or inadvertently consequently this will affect not only the person with impairment but also to the affected family because disabled usually they will bring along somebody to assist them either a family members or their assistants well, according to the United Nations, persons with disability include those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual, or sensory impairments, which in interactions with various uh, barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. 
If this stability is determined to be the need for solution that are a modification of the norm, then every person will experience this ability in their lifetime. Things for sure, we celebrate our birthday every year. We not only receive our present, but the package included with the additional of extra number to our age. So we will be aging. And as we can see, those people we love around us, they are getting older and sometimes they might have difficulties, which made them not very fascinated to go out with us anymore. Elderly might have difficulties to work due to osteoporosis, or some might have cataracts, or some severe cases which um, they might have problems due to Parkinson's disease. We don't ever realize environmental uh, barriers have hindered their full and effective participation in society. There are three types of disability. First is a uh, where we call it as permanently disabled, um, which uh, this is it is a condition such as disability associated to physical, developmental, um, intellectual, and sensory. So we have. Um, hearing disability, visual disability, uh, mobility, cognitive learning, and multiple disability. So hearing impairment, they, they have the uh, various level of uh, impairment, which the poor ability to hear, the uh, possibility of bad hearing, which need an assistance of hearing aid. And there is also a condition which it is, a, it is called as total death, which the individual does not have the ability to hear at all. As for visual impairment, almost similar to hearing impairment, there is a people with a serious visual problem which they need a pair of glasses to help them to have a clearer vision. And on the other hand, there is a blind people which they are not able to see at all. Mobility impairment is a condition which an individual have a difficulty to move to a movement from gross motor skill to fine motor skill. While cognitive learning impairment, referring to those with limitation on their brain functioning, there are a wide range of cognitive and, uh, cognitive and learning impairment from Down syndrome to ADHD. And this impairment does give implication to learning development of a child. While multiple disability is a condition where the individual have more than one disabilities, it is also known as comorbidity. Okay, the second type is a temporary disabled. Um, a disability that affects you for a short period of time. This condition usually keep you incapacitated uh, of, or out of work for a few days, weeks, months, or year, by typically result in the eventual recovery. So this is a situation where caused by chronic health conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and respiratory illness and injuries. Or pregnancy, accident which a person might have a broken arm or leg or sprain, sprain their ankle while exercising. Okay. The third types of disability is a situational disable. It is a condition where depend for continued existence and activity among life sustaining equipment or special procedures or care such as um, restriction in physical endurance such as those who have issues with their weight, having kids, elderly, or restriction relating to tolerance of environmental influences, such as newly parent dealing with their kids and problems with language, especially when we from a non-English speaking country, uh, country going for a tour to another country. So uh, language can be a barrier.
Okay, this is Peter Tan. Um, he's a disability rights advocate, which he highlighted an issue on how a disabled person from Cheras who wanted to go to KLCC, where which there were too many barriers in the built environments and people and public transport system that makes the journey impossible. Some of the issues highlighted is that the bus has been upgraded with RAM, but the facility that need to support the upgrading was not upgraded. Okay, this is for those who have not yet come to Malaysia. Let, let me give you some ideas where about is Churras and how far it is from KLCC. Okay, I will choose a residential areas called Bandar Sungai Long over here down here and the distance to KLCC is approximately um, 25.3 kilometers if we drive to KLCC however if you decided to commute by public transport it will take you about more than one and a half hour to reach KLCC and it will it, and with lots of barriers and accessibility issues the PWDs might need more time to reach KLCC so why does accessibility important for a city? I believe I have explained earlier the importance of a city and some of the issues that need to be revisited, which is associated to PWDs. Okay. Before I proceed with accessibility issue, let me take a break. Okay, this is not really a break, but it is, um, I don't have a, a quiz, but I would like to. Uh, I would like everybody to focus on your screen. Okay. Have you ever experienced being a disabled? Okay. Let me try this. How does a dyslexic see? Okay. I want everybody to focus on your screen and try to read this article. Are you okay? Well, um, do you know anybody who are dyslexic? Basically, dyslexia is a learning disorder that involves difficulty reading due to problems, identifying speech sounds, and learning how they relate to letters and words, which is decoding. And do you know how the brain process and translate text? So this is what they see. This is for those with severe dyslexic. Okay. Like we try with another example. So this is a bit mild. This is much easier for you to read. Just focus to the screen. So can you can you read the articles? Is it okay? Can you handle it? Okay, this is an example how a dyslexic see images of text. Those moving alphabets are sort of difficulty that they need to learn how to control it. Okay. Well, this is example which um, might be for those with a mild dyslexic, which the movement of the alphabet is a bit slower. This is one of the reasons why a dyslexic have a difficulties to read text. But they are very good with symbols or images. Okay? Because it is difficult to see, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the movement of uh, images instead of the movement of text. The text makes us more confused as compared to um, images. Okay? Now, back to our topic that we left earlier. Okay, I'm going to show you some of the examples that commonly happen within our city. Okay, are we aware that um, things like shoes in these two images of RAM, which the wheelchair user could not pass through the lane because the wheelchair could not fit in the steel fence that the park authority installed to avoid motorcyclists from entering the park 
Okay, this was safety purposes, but at the same time, it create difficulties for the PWDs to get their access. Okay, but sometimes vandalism like this, you know, the the drain cap, uh, vandalism um, uh, can be can all cause dangerous not only to the but the PWDs but also to other users. You see. A continuous maintenance is very important to ensure that a park is accident free because park is meant for all to enjoy. Okay, bottom right, bottom right is an example of how design can be dangerous. It is good to, to have a park which you can touch the, um, the water uh, elements, but on the other hand, it is dangerous uh, to the PWDs, which if it is happened that they can't control the, the wheelchair or the balance, the body balance, but it can um, create dangerous to children too, which they might fall into the lake if not being monitored by adult. Okay. Next, can you see what is wrong with the parking? What is wrong with the parking? This is an accessible parking. Well, first, it was not designed according to the standard. As I mentioned in earlier slide, they don't have space to set up their wheelchair. You know, actually, the the the, the sizes should be a bit bigger. Okay, and then, can you see? Is there any ramp? to allow them to access the park. It was blocked by the concrete cube, okay? And then the width of the access lane was not designed according to the width of a wheelchair. So a wheelchair cannot get through it. So these are the, some of the mistakes that sometimes we feel we, we have accommodated them, but it was not according to a standard. So following a standard is, uh, good solutions, actually. Okay, I always love to share this illustration sketch by my junior, Mr. Azarimi. You can find uh, lots of his sketches associated to accessibility uh, from his Facebook. He is a trained architect and his illustration representing a situation which many might not aware of. Okay, transportation hub is very important to be assessed by PWD. Sometimes small gaps like this will not allow PWDs to board onto a train. A good ramp with a correct gradient like this uh, will ease the wheelchair user or their assistant to pull them on board. Okay, this is some guidelines of what good gradients to be a guide for you to prepare a RAM for a PWDs. With ratio one to 20, they can be independent, but with a bit steep ratio such as one to 10, they might need an assistant. But if it is more than one to 10, the wheelchair can fall back, okay? This has a an example of best practice that can be done at a transportation hub without the need of big financial implication. You know, you don't have to um, do some modification or any uh, construction works. So such as providing assistance at the counter, providing designated counter for PWDs, special lien for PWDs, um, you can have this pictogram chart, which it will assist you to communicate with those with hearing impaired or those with learning disability because they just they know the the pictures or the images, so they can just show on the chart. So you can communicate with them. You can ask them where they do, do, do they want to go, so they can point to the bus. Okay, might be they want to you to assist them to the bus. Okay. So pictogram chart is very important. So next is as simple as paper and pen. 
You just need paper and pen to build up a friendship with a deaf person, but it would be very good if you know some basic sign language, such as thank you, hi, and a very simple uh, clapping hands, all those kind of things, a very simple basic things. Or even you can just memorize the 24 alphabets in sign languages. So you just spell it out using your fingers so you can communicate with them. That is as simple as that. Okay. Well, as a designer or city planner, it is good if we can aware, we are aware of small issues that gives huge impact to PWDs. These are situations which PWDs are not able to get to the bus stop or board onto a bus because of the gap, the steps is so high. So they can't, you know, you can't, you can't, you, even if you wanted to help them, you might need more than one person to carry them, carry the, the, the whole wheelchair onto the, uh, the slab, okay? Okay, there are sometimes we've seen this situation which for certain people, it does not give any implication, but as you can see in the images, how which are using an elderly was affected due to this irresponsible attitude. Shown in the top right of your screen is the standard which we should have followed if we wanted to design or provide spaces for accessible parking. The parking need to have extra spaces either to the left or to the right because sometimes the car was drive by PWD and sometimes they are our passenger. So either, either side, okay? These are another similar example as discussed in the earlier slide. So you can see how um, able-bodied uh, person using all these PWD facilities. So this will, at the end of the day, will create problems for PWD to get access to the facilities. Okay, ramp and step or ladder should be designed according to standard gradient as mentioned earlier. It is difficult for a wheelchair user to wheel onto a steep ramp. This is because they need extra strength to wheel the wheelchair and at the same time, they need to control it. And if it is too steep, they might have the risk to fall backward. There is also a situation where the accessible road was blocked due to irresponsible attitude, such as like this. Well, this is another example which uh, the design was considering uh, a ramp instead of a steps, which a ramp can be used by everybody. So this design is for all. So this is another good example. Um, this is, if I'm not mistaken, this is in one of the educate, higher edu education institutions in Malaysia. It's, it's in uh, University of Malaysia, Putra, Malaysia, which they provided a ramp to the library. Okay. Well, this is pedestrian path. Pedest pedestrian path should be cleared from any mm -hmm. obstacle. This might happen either due to design fail, design fail like this, or uh, um, irresponsible attitude. You know, this kind of irresponsible attitude. This uh, van is blocking the tech pile, which the, the person, this blind person with his white skin, he might not uh, see that, uh, uh, the, the van in front of him because he's using this deck pad as a guide for, for him to move around, okay? Another example of path we wish was blocked by an object, okay? Sometimes, you know, the design itself. Um, okay, a wider pathway can help the deaf during conversation because um, the deaf need to see the other partner's face because they communicated uh, using sign language. So if you provide a wider, uh, wider uh, pathway or wider ramp, it is good for them to continue with their conversations, okay? 
And then in fact, you can create a, a space, ample space for these kids to socialize because the wheelchair user, the kids with, with wheelchair can run along with his friends here. Okay. And then um, steps are most difficult and dangerous to people using crutches or walking sticks. So basically, the in the first situation, it is good to have a handrails, you know, to support or assist the user using crutches. But in these images, which you can see here, um, the gap is too high. So they might have difficulties in terms of, you know, pulling their legs onto the steps, okay? And then this is a situation is where a ramp was not provided and to make the thing worse is that there was no handrails at all. At least the handrails can give a better support for this uh, person here, but it would be much better if there is somebody who can lend their hand to help, okay? PWD want to be independent. That is the main reason why we need to have safe and accessible built environment. Okay, detailing in construction and poor maintenance can cause accidents. This is some of the examples because if you can see here the grating, the gap um, on the grating uh, steels, it might... Uh, the, 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 the front wheels of a wheelchair, which is smaller size, might stuck onto the grid if it is not, uh, if it's the, 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 the gap is too, too big. Okay, this is an, another example which a person with a mobility scooter, which he fell off due to this, um, the, main, the poor maintenance, okay, the poor maintenance. Okay, do not ignore the importance of detailing in design because doorknob, for example, it's very small. Uh, for example, the key entry doorknob is difficult to be opened by a person who have no fingers because they can't twist. But lever doorknob would be the better choice which it meet the function to be fulfilled by all users. Either you can pull it down like this, or you can use your arm to put it down. So liver door is much better compared to the uh, center key knob, okay? Okay, another one is counter. Um, counter should be the most functional elements that need to be designed to accommodate the needs of various users. Um, what you can see here, basically counter is designed based on human anthropometric and, and how the anthropometric of a user to be better, a clear space under the counter uh, will give a better position to the wheelchair user so they can have a good eye contact during communications with the officer in charge. You can hurt your neck because if you put your wheelchair by its side of the counter, you know, you have to just you need to 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 see by facing them uh, the opposite side. Okay. Commonly a toilet uh, door are installed to be open inward. However, um door for an accessible toilet should be open outward. You know, you, you need to put it out. This is to ensure that uh, a wheelchair user can close the door to have their privacy. Because once, if the door is uh, put inward, the wheelchair itself might, um, you know, block the door from being closed. Other than that, the features uh, such as the grab bars are installed based on their function. Some are suitable to be fixed installed, such as the one we have on the wall, but um, some need to be flexible. 
for example, like this, because wheelchair user have different strength in on uh, hand uh, strength because they will move uh, from the wheelchair to the WC depending on which side that they are more stronger. So they can either from this side, this side or this side. So there, there, there are 12 uh, positions uh, which they can transfer themselves from wheelchair to a WC. So if we have a fixed bar like this, it is difficult because this we will need them to, you know, move towards the WC. So it's difficult for them to move either by uh, uh, side move or uh, diagonal move. Okay, next is, I love this one because it is important to have devices that can alert people who are hearing impaired. You might have a blinking light or alarm with vibrations, or you may use paper and pen as mentioned earlier for communications. It is good for us, as I mentioned earlier, to have a basic sign language. At least if you know sign alphabet, you can spell. Um, this is an example in Penang, Malaysia, which we have a signing Starbucks cafe. But in India, they have a KFC uh, who have put their in initiative to employ person with speech and hearing impact as their employee. And the one of my favorite example here is the best practice in Philippines, which um, they put up a poster with a basic sign language. So their customer can try to communicate with them. At least somebody is learning new things while doing the their ordering. Okay, I know that in Indonesia you have cafe called Finger Talk, which run by the deaf. So congratulations, Indonesia. Okay, next is fixed furniture at the eating outlet create difficulties for PWDs to move about or to eat comfortably. If we add some flexibility in the layout arrangement with some loose chair, we not only ease their difficulty to move in between the tables, but we can also create spaces for social interactions. Okay, this is on ATM and vending machines. ATM and vending machines should be considered um, the needs of PWDs too, because um, um, the slide, uh, in this slide, it shows an examples of, of ATM and vending machine which the design has been accommodating to the PWDs. But how about where about it was located? Is it reachable by the PWDs? I have a friend who was physically impaired and he's using a wheelchair. He told me that although there was an ATM machine just a few minute wheel from his house, he have to go to another ATM machine which located within a few minutes drive because the ATM machine is easier for him to get to as compared the one that he have near to his house. No steps, no barriers which he can access to the ATM machines easier. Okay. Okay, lift and its maintenance has a very significant relationship. Uh, without a good maintenance, lift may not well function. Many might affected by it in a high rise residential, not just the PWDs, elderly, children, pregnant mother, and other resident, res, residents too. Okay, this is uh, a huge uh, problem, especially for those living in the city, uh, living in an apartment, which um, they have a limited access of lift to, to going up and down. So if it is happened that the lift break down, so what happened to the wheelchair user or other um, elderly? So this is an example of how considerations among the city dwellers, how sensitive they are to the 
uh, our PWD's friends. Okay. Okay, let's take another break again. Okay. Well, this time in our break sessions, I want to introduce to my big family. I believe you do remember this slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have six children. Okay. My third child, Hazi, has a comorbid. He was diagnosed with my ADHD and he is also a severe dyslexic. And not him alone, my fifth and sixth child, they were also diagnosed with mild dyslexic. As I mentioned earlier, dyslexic might have difficulty to process text. It depends on how severe they are. But they are very good at memorizing symbols, icons, images, and that is how they learn to read. They memorize the shape of alphabet and recognize the sound. That is why most of them is using uh, phonic. Well, basically, we enjoy traveling as, and as a mother, the most important thing is the safety of my children. So this is sort of like a revision from my, my earliest slide. Um, well, when we travel to, when we travel as a family, um, especially to a country which their native language is not either Malay language or Indonesian or English, uh, we should, they have different culture and different language. So that will be our or my, me and my family most difficult barrier, which is the language itself. So in our case, I will make sure that I provided name tag that complete with all the important information, such as contact number and address where we stay. And I usually tied it to their, you know, their pants. So just to make sure it will, they will not lose it. Okay. Why I'm telling you this? Okay. That for signages. It's important for me and my kids to get to know places and facilities that they have within their vicinity. So these are some common icons that are uh, used to indicate a toilet or other facilities. This was taken in, I can't remember, but this is uh, at the airport during my trip to Turkey. I used to take all these sort of images just to, to for my kid because I want to show everybody on how it works, either it's good or either it's bad, okay? This is some of the examples. This is very simple and straightforward uh, icon that being used in public spaces. And with this new icon design, uh, which I think sometimes creativity fail, my special keys might have difficulties to translate the images. Uh, with this new icon design, I don't think that my special kid could understand it clearly uh, to regular symbols uh, as compared to a regular symbols uh, icon that have been used. So we can have creative, creative in design, but not too creative, which can confuse not only those with cognitive problems, but also other children or elders. <laughs> This table was, take, was taken from one of the United Nations publications showing a journey stage, which there was a suggestion on how we can make their journey better and without have to face with any barriers. So for example, uh, getting from home to bus stops or stations, for a wheelchair user, they need a, a appropriate wheelchair. For those with walking difficulties, they might need a smooth surfaces, which is, associate to a good maintenance, barrier-free sidewalk, and a resting place. Uh, this is some of the example which I, I will share the, my slide with the organizers. So you can refer to this table. It's very good. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, everybody wants to be independent. Same goes to our PWD friends. The slide shows some of our PWD friends that manage to do lots of activities that normal people usually do. 
We can see special athletes uh, which have also managed to win medals. There are also PWD who campaign and earn his income by selling his artworks, sewing, and become an entrepreneur. Okay, PWDs also have the right to education. Shown in the upper left of the slide, with a wheelchair, she's a prominent economic professor in my university. And next to her is an alumni from our university. He was once in a mission to climb up to the mid station of the Everest. And next to him, she is a senator in one of the city council in Malaysia. So they are contributing to the society. And we can see the example here that they can be successful and contributing their knowledge to the society. And at the bottom right is Mr. Lee Kiamua. He is a successful um, entrepreneur who owns Speed Mart 99, who has hundreds of mud outlet throughout Malaysia. And we can see similar situation in this slide too. Grab company also has opened a platform for PWD to earn their income. Um, well, before we end our session today, it is important to know that everybody has their important roles to ensure that we can have an accessible city. You may start by participating in public engagement for any development proposal. This is a stage that conducted by the local authority at the pre-development stage. So you can highlight any improvement related to accessibility. You may start to stop vandalism. All facilities that have been provided within our built environment was prepared for us. So we have the rights to utilize the facilities and this made us responsible to our built environment. Give opinion or suggestion because your suggestion might give positive changes and improve our cities. Be a caring rest and responsible citizen. Lend your hand to ease other pains and difficulties. The only dis disabilities in life is a bad attitude. Okay, as a conclusion, we might face various spectrum in of incident throughout our journey in life. But at the end of the journey, I think one thing for sure is that we are getting mature and older. We might not need the accessibility now because we are young and strong. But it is good for us to ensure that we are living in accessible city, which it will benefit us once we are old. So this is not for us now, but we might need it later on in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Ibu Izawati um, for such a rich presentation. I believe that both of uh, our two presenters here give us a um, strong discourse on both of the topic. So ladies and gentlemen, now we've come to the question and answer session. So um, I have already had some questions here in the chat box and also in the form of response. So before I read the question in the chat box, allow me to read questions from the uh, given form response uh, to both of our professor here today. So the first question uh, dedicated to Ibu Professor Hasliza um, from Bapak Basuki Winarno from Institut Teknologi 10 November. And um, he asked about, is there a study regarding the effect of propagation this wave in long periods? And what is that? And the second question is dedicated to Ibu Professor um, Izawati, uh, also from uh, Bapak Basuki Narno, that asks, do you have a framework to measure the person with disabilities performance while a company utilize their performance um, in a manufacture or business process. So I think uh, that is first the first uh, two questions for both of our professor. Maybe the first um, uh, opportunity will come to Ibu uh, Hasliza. 
Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, actually, I didn't uh, clearly hear the question. Uh, the, the study about the propagation of uh, of what? Huh? Uh, I will. Of, uh, uh, EMF. Yes. Is there a study regarding the effect of propagation this wave in the long periods? And what is that? Okay. Um, yes. Um, for, for this kind of uh, investigation or studies, uh, we divide it into two. Um, what what uh, we have been doing is uh, focusing on the short-term uh, exposure. So um, we, we did an investigation for 30 to 60 minutes. And yes, of course, uh, there are about several studies are doing for the long-term, but for the long-term, they are focusing on the animal study instead of uh, human study. They are using the animals um, so that uh, they, they can expose uh, the exposure for a very long time, uh, two hours per day. So this is what we regard as a chronic exposure. Yes, uh, there are several uh, published studies in peer review journals uh, on this, and they uh, investigate on the biological effects such as DMA, uh, DNA damage, uh, and so on, uh, on the rats. And for the humans, uh, what we what they did is uh, they focus on the um, asking the question. Okay, um, uh, they they went to population which are very close to the base station uh, tower, and they conduct a study for um, two to three years. Okay, so you you can find this kind of studies in peer reviewed journals uh, for the high impact journals, uh, Q1 or Q2 journals, in the area of bioelectromagnetics, and from their studies. Um, very few are reporting uh, the the there is an effect for the uh, RM RF EMF exposure. Yeah, majority uh, stating that uh, no long term effects, even though uh, populations or society or publics are being exposed uh, by the um, RF from the base station exposure. Okay, so hopes that it, it can clear your. Uh, Yes, thank you, Ibu uh, Professor Hasliza. Now, uh, uh, Ibu Izawati, would you answer the uh, second question also from Bapak Masuti Wanano? Okay, this is regarding on if we have any measurements. Okay, in Malaysia, we practice access auditing, which um, we assess audit the, the we access, uh, we audit the accessibility to various uh, building typology. So during the, the, the process, we have the access auditor, uh, auditor together with PWD because we need them to give some command, uh, a real experience of uh, the accessibility that provided at those buildings. So this same, this same goes to the, the building that referring to the questions. So, um, during doing this, uh, the process of the editing, we are using uh, based on star rating system, which we, we have been developing a star rating system, which we give marks. And at the end of the uh, process, the, the, the building will get their star rating. So this star rating is not to penalize the building, but this will give a database to the uh, a collection of database uh, for the uh, for the PWDs, so they can know whether they can access to the building or not. And as for the building owners, what they can do is that from the star rating reports, they can improve the uh, rating system of their building. So from time to time, this will be a sustainability of the process, which um, at the end of the day, it will give access to everybody. And if you provide this, uh, provide these uh, facilities to them, so it, it there will be no harm for them to 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 get access into any types of building typology. So these are the very simple me uh, measurement that we are using in Malaysia. So th there's no specific uh, 
measurement to assess any uh, as per this discuss as, as questions. Thank you, please, Awati. Now, uh, let us move on to the question uh, in the chat box. I think, I believe that is uh, dedicated to Ibu uh, Professor Hasliza from uh, Bapak Sangin Kahtan that asks, I would like to know, have you contacted the real measurement? And if yes, what is your equipment and how much is the maximum exposure at the base station? Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Papa, for asking me this kind of question. Uh, yes, uh, I, uh, I'm i not contacting uh, the people who are doing the measurement. Actually, I am, uh, me and my team are doing this uh, kind of research since 2015 up until now. So the recent one is the 5G millimeter waves. And um, we have... Um, uh, very reliable equipment from Brad and Schwartz uh, from uh, Germany. Uh, this is what we are using. Uh, the one that I show you is uh, one of the equipments. And, and also what, what we did for the measurements are based on the peer-reviewed journals. Okay, so all the uh, procedures, uh, the, the standard procedures uh, to, um, to, to set up the experiment, uh, the guidelines are according to the worldwide guidelines. And the maximum uh, exposure limits uh, set by ICNIP, uh, the one that I explained in my lectures, um, up, to, uh, up to 10 uh, for the power density, uh, 10 watt per meter square. Okay, So uh, normally, we do not go up to uh, that extension because if you go for that extension, you will need a very high power to power up your equipment. Uh, this is what uh, we are not doing. And then one more, um, okay, what, one more, uh, the key parameters that we are considering is the power field regions. Uh, it cannot be very close to the uh, base station tower. What we are using uh, in, is a laboratory uh, environment. Uh, we are trying to emulate what is inside what is uh, uh, at the outside environment uh, in the laboratory, uh, the one that I show you in the picture, uh, our lab. So that's where we conduct the experiment for the uh, 4G and also for the 5G um, RF effects on human health. Okay, so um, what we did is uh, the maximum level that we set is uh, one ten. Uh, out of uh, the permissible uh, maximum permissible level by the ICNIP uh, guidelines. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you can uh, actually. I have published uh, one of my works in Nature Scientific Reports. It's a high impact journal, a renowned journal in 2015 uh, for the RF EMF effect, short term uh, exposure for 2G and 3G exposure, okay? And then uh, another papers I published in also high impact journals uh, in year 2019. Uh, this is to uh, study the effects of the wearable textile uh, antenna exposure on the human body. So this is more uh, critical compared to the base station. Why? Because um, the radiating structure uh, of the EMF are placed onto the body. So uh, you have to be very careful not to use uh, high power, and then you have to ensure that uh, the, the parameter are being set according to the uh, worldwide guidelines. So if you are uh, very interested in this kind of research, you can contact me later so that we can have a collaboration in the future. Okay, thank you, Ibu. What uh, a nice uh, offer uh, from you, Ibu, uh, to have some uh, collaboration on this. So um, while we uh, have question in a chat box, uh, and we still have time to have more discussion directly, I would like to invite a few questions from the participant 
who is given the opportunity to ask the speaker directly. So please also give um, uh, to whom the question is dedicated to. Please raise your hand. Uh, very rare opportunities to uh, ask uh, both of our professor today. Okay. Ibu Fenika, maybe? Okay. So um, I think I have um, one question to ask to Professor. Uh, has Lisa, that um, when we talk about the public concern related to human health, we are aware to the fact that um, 5G exposure have its own myth and fact. Um, but what we can sum up that the interaction between human body and the network could also give some effect, but it's not in the way that could uh, uh, be a very serious uh, in uh, health consequences. In your opinion, Ibu Hasliza, in what way possible do you think we have uh, or should have a healthy habit concerning the 5G exposure? Uh, yes, Ibu Hasliza. Yeah. Uh, Ibu Nur Enda, uh, can, can you repeat because uh, my line is breaking just now? It's oh, okay. Unstable. Yeah, the line okay. is unstable. Yes. Um, the, my the, question. The last, the last line. Yes, Ibu. Uh, in um, my question is, um, in your opinion, uh, in what way possible, uh, do you think that we should have a healthy habit concerning the five G exposure? Because at uh, before presentation, uh, you have noted that. Um, it is related also to the human health, but um, instead of uh, directing it to the um, um, uh, public exposure, maybe we should have a healthy habit first. Do you think that um, um, there is any healthy habit concerning that uh, 5G exposure for us? Uh, thank you, Ibu Nurenda, for the question. Um, yes, uh, of course, we have to have healthy habit. And uh, in order to develop this healthy habit, we have to know um, the, the, the criteria, okay? The criteria, um, uh, what is the uh, safe distance between us and also the base station? and what is the safe uh, distance between our house to the base stations okay why because um, if you are if you are living very close to base station yes um, of course uh, there will be some effects in the long term run very close okay I, I'm, I'm not saying that um, i'm not saying that uh, it is not uh, safe uh, it is safe, but uh, we, we also worry uh, on the side effects, even though um, in, in the literature findings, scientific uh, findings stating that there is no whatsoever effects in the long run, but we don't want that kind uh, that things to happen. Uh, that, that's why uh, you have to limit your distance from the base station. Um, you just uh, stay away from the base station uh, in in the range up to uh, two meters from the base station, okay? And um, if, if you are living uh, very close to the base station, uh, I hope that you can do medical checkup for uh, every six months so that you can know um, what are your symptoms, uh, if you are having, if you are suffering from the headache, because we, we, we don't know. We don't know whether it's coming from the base station we don't know it's coming from the food that you are eating uh, or um, the, the environments uh, that uh, give you uh, some factors that 
uh, affects your health. Okay, so it is better for you to to always uh, do the medical checkup. Uh, it is uh, advisable around uh, every six months so that you can be diagnostic by the professional, by the medical uh, doctors, and uh, you can know um, the, the real reason uh, for uh, the status of your health uh, from time to time. Okay, And um, the, the other things is uh, in order to maintain uh, good health, uh, you also have to be. Uh, uh, you you also have to do some uh, healthy lifestyles like uh, exercising, eating healthy foods. Okay, so we want we want to prevent this kind of things to happens. Uh, yes, I know that e EMF uh, is uh, brings worry to people, but we cannot uh, run away from that. Uh, we, are, we are always surrounded, even we are at school, we are at house, we are using the Wi-Fi, you know, Wi-Fi is also the, uh, the EMF signals. And, but uh, we have to understand that all of the signals are only uh, operate uh, uh, within the minimum uh, power uh, that will not affect your health. Okay, so let's say, uh, if you are living close to the TV or broadcast uh, transmission tower, uh, I think uh, it will give uh, more effects compared to the base station tower. Why? Because the power is very huge. It can go up to 100 kilowatts. Uh, so the main, the key points here is uh, what makes EMF dangerous or the very high power. Why? Because when, when the power is increasing, it will introduce more heat. Uh, uh, our, our body will absorb more, uh, more EMF and will uh, change to the heat. And this is what we are worrying. It will uh, affect, our, uh, affect our organ and, and other, uh, what's that, in, in other internal uh, organs of our body. Okay, so uh, uh, that, that's why uh, I say uh, we have to be uh, educated. We have to know about uh, what's dangerous, uh, what is not, and how to prevent it. Okay, so uh, hope that uh, I answer you well, uh, Ibu Nur Eda. Very well answered, Ibu. Uh, because uh, I think that it is very important to understand in what way our ha healthy habit could uh, prevent us from uh, 5G exposure. Because we know that uh, 5G is now a very, um, you know, a trend. But also, it's uh, is also in a wider range. We we didn't know if we don't have this kind of knowledge. Thank you, Ibu. It's very helpful. So I think now uh, it comes to uh, questions again from Ibu Arina Hayati from Department of Architecture ITS okay. uh, that will ask Ibu Izawati uh, directly. Yeah, thank you, Ibu Arina. Yeah, thank you, Bu Nufi. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Bu Izawati. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Arina and I'm lecturer from Department of Architecture. And I'm also a woman with disability. So I have polio when I was uh, six months old and I use crutches and sometimes I use wheelchair. So it's, it's a very uh, enlightening presentation for today. And I'm very glad that you provide such a very rich uh, presentation and information. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering about one thing that uh, you are, I can say that you are one of the activists for uh, PWD. So uh, if I'm, I'm asking you a question, uh, because both of us uh, teaching in, uh, you are in Last Cup uh, and Design uh, Departments, and I also in Department of Architecture. Do you have any, uh, you know, uh, any class related to universal design topics? And also, if you have uh, that class, uh, do you have any specific methods, for example, teaching methods, uh, you know, for students, especially for design students in your uh, university? I think I think that's all uh, my question, uh, Bunufi. Thank you. Uh. 
Okay, thank, thank you very much, Bu Arina. Well, in uh, International Islamic University, especially Kuliah um, of Architecture, uh, what we have uh, specifically in the Department of Landscape Architecture and also the Department of Architecture have a universal design subject, which our students, we, we, we teach them how to do access auditing and they need to have this kind of knowledge to allow them to design a better accessible um, design to be used by all. And then at the university level, we have a, a unit that it calls Disabled Service Unit, which they were remember during uh, in my slide, uh, Prof. Zita, the, the, the wheelchair user. Well, um, He's the director of the SU. So what they did in this unit is that uh, they keep on doing a training, awareness training uh, to all staff and students. Um, for examples, uh, such as uh, awareness programs, and then they have a sign language classes, which this is just to allow all the community can get together. There will be no discriminations, and this is to allow those able body uh, staff and students to understand better our friends with, uh, with disability. So basically what we have is, um, we are referring to um, uh, manuals that we have in Standard Nation. We have uh, the latest manual was MS1184, which it's referring to um, accessibility to build environment. And this year they are revising the, the manual again. So there will be some consideration that taken into uh, the new manual because of our current transitions in terms of technology and uh, so forth. That's all, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, I think that's that's very important message uh, for us, Bu Nufi, because IPS hasn't have that kind of uh, department or institution, you know, uh, because, and I hope next time ITS will include uh, that things that you have mentioned before. Uh -huh. <laughs> in a institute, I think that institute we should level. have um, a yeah, collaboration yeah. also. on. Yes, that, that, that will be happening. great. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you for your kind uh, answer and I hope uh, we can meet another question. Thank you, yes, Bunuki, sure. for the times. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bu Arina. Thank you, Bu Izawad. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, now we finally come to the end of this guest lecture series on SDGs. I would like to take a short conclusion from what all both of great speakers today has presented. So today's topic are concerning about society, health and the way technology like 5G network exposure and paradigms like inclusivity as a mindset of giving equal accessibilities for people with disabilities in city. It gives us a context to understand contemporary issues of difference and progress of impact of technology. Both of two presenters gave us the understanding of how knowledge is fundamental in shaping an advocation to the nature of being a human being shaping the future, but also criticized in facilitating the process. Like both of two professors said, everybody counts, everybody is important. So thank you again. Um, I'd like to thank the, both of our great speakers today for the informative and interesting presentation and all the participants for the very active participation. Finally, please give the applause for the speaker and for you all. Thank you. Over to you as our MC of today's guest lecture. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you all. See you again. Thank you. Terima kasih, Bu. Terima kasih. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak. Oke. Thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you again once again to Professor Haziza and Professor Itawati for an excellent lecture today. And also thank you for Ibu Norenda for conducting this amazing session. And furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to our speakers and also for our moderator today. Okay. So first certificate for Professor Hasliza. Yay. Okay. Okay. So the next certificate is for Professor Izawati. Okay, and last is for Ibu Nur Enda Nufida. Okay, once again, we would like to thank you very much for such an insightful um, lecture today for your upload availability on today's guest lecture series. We believe that your lecture will be useful for all participants. Okay, now before we end our lecture today, I would like to invite our all participants as well as the honorable speaker and moderator to take a group photo. And please to all participants, please open your camera and have a big smile so we can have a documentation of today's session. Okay. Okay, I see there is a two page in here. For the first page, smile. One, two, three. Okay, for the second page, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, so now we've finished the group photo. And to the participant, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly slash feedback underscore GLS that you can see also in the Zoom chat room. And the deadline for filling the feedback is one hour after we finish this session. And we will want to remind you that the participant who will get the stamp or the participant who come on time Join this event until the end and also fill the feedback form. Okay, and for next week, we will have a next interesting topics and another two streams. And yeah, as we can see, there is a poster that has been showed by committee in the, in the presentation. Okay. And finally, we have reached the end of today's guest lecture series, and we sincerely apologize for any mistake we might have made in proceeding as a matter of ceremony and committee. And thank you very much for our honorable speakers, moderator, all participants for the attention and cooperation. We hope to see you soon after this event in the future. Don't forget to follow our social media, Instagram at ITS International Office and also Facebook and keep updated of our programs. So that's all from us. Good afternoon. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu. Let me end the session in five, three, two, one. Thank you.